And what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Designated Players, and MLS podcast. MLS news has been heating back up since our break last week, so we're here to break it all down. Stories, news, and everything else. Give our thoughts, opinions, and, and give both sides, you know, because that's what we do. We, we break it down from a neutral point of view. First off, Kucha Hernandez has been missing from Columbus for the last two games. And while it seems he may be back in the mix for this past weekend, which he was, Wilfred Nancy was incredibly blunt in his attempt to deflect questions about it. A conversation on the transparency issues in MLS will take place in this episode, so stick around for that. Then the New England Revolution have released renderings of their new soccer-specific stadium proposal in Everett. We'll dive into all the news and the highlight, the good, the bad, and the difficult things behind getting it over the line. And finally, there's been a lot of anti-MLS views online that have shifted slightly from MLS to its affiliate MLS Next Pro. Basis claims are flying around yet again about MLS Next Pro trying to kill off lower league soccer, followed by the U.S. Open results being used as a gotcha moment instead of celebrating the results of the lower league sides pulling off upsets. We'll cover that as well, along with a lot of other things in this week's MLS news. Right. So we got that break in. Connor can now, now fit in the, the edit and I will introduce him now. How are you doing, Connor? Uh, I'm doing great because now I have, another bit of audio to edit out of the recording listen i am i am nothing if not helpful to you so you're welcome something like that it's been been a little bit since we sat down and and chatted we didn't do uh we did back-to-back fun game fridays in one recording so we didn't meet up for for that and it's been a little bit so i'm excited to get and get back into uh into some news because the top 10 was fun got some got some good views online but it's not not the same as going into what's the nitty gritty of what's going on right now, you know. Yep. So, before we do that, of course, we do have to dive into scarf of the week. So I want to know what you're rocking. Oh, of course, I'm bringing out Columbus because we're talking about Cucho. So I'm bringing out my. There we go, Columbus scarf. So I went to everything except the crew logo on that one. That was that was the basic pick, right? Like, that was easy. <laughs> So I didn't do that. I went with something a little bit more niche, which actually links two of our teams. Because back in 2019, a team called Hartford Athletic started playing. And there was the possibility slash opportunity for them to become the New England Revolution affiliate and be their MLS Next Pro team for, you know, before MLS Next Pro existed. So I broke out the upside down. There we go. The Hartford Athletic scarf, which I really like. I love the colors. It's a great little material. Um, I brought it out a few times now, but um, yeah, big big fan of this one. I think it's really nice. Lovely. Yeah, I was gonna see, I was gonna give you the. Do you know who almost was their affiliate? But <laughs> we did that last time, and you it took it took too long to figure it out. So I said skip. skip I got it on me. the first try. What do you mean? Yeah, but it took you like four minutes to do it. I cut out so much. <laughs> That's so much an of the time. exaggeration and a half. All right. You know, it's not an exaggeration and a half. The fact that Kucha Hernandez is being something happened with him and we don't know what it is. It's actually an under exaggeration, if you will, because we don't know anything that's happening. He is not. He, he came back this weekend. We're recording this Sunday. So he came back this weekend. Uh, but the previous two games against Nashville and Tigres, in MLS and CCL respectively, he was not included. Now, the crew technically picked up two points. I know one was a CCL, CCC game, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but they had a 2-2 draw against Nashville and a 1-1 draw versus Tigres. But it really does beg the question, what caused this? Why was he not included? And that question was followed up with a lot of radio silence and deflection. Uh, after the game against Nashville, Wilfred Nancy was asked, what's up? Why? What, where is he? Um, and he basically just said, hey, it's a team policy. We're, we're going to deal with it from there and whatever. And then he missed the game against Tigres, which, again, one of the biggest games they had this season. And he was very quick to mention when asked about it again that it's a team game and they're not playing tennis. Sorry to, sorry to throw your game under the bus there, but he goes, we don't play tennis. There are 11 players on the field and he doesn't want to talk about just missing one player. Connor, after you stop crying over the shot at tennis, can you do you? Wonder why he's so shelled up about this? Firstly, 
Wilfred Nancy is now on my hit list. Um, <laughs> all the respect I had for him is completely erased right now. Absolutely no reason to catch a stray like that. Um, it's a really interesting topic. They were talking about it a little bit on 360. And, and I'll hit you with my own question later on about this topic as well. But yeah, I mean, I had the same thought that I think we're kind of leaning towards right now. And it's just the lack of transparency when it comes to things in MLS. And I don't need them to like jump to conclusions and come out and be like, Cucho specifically did this, but just like some idea of what's going on would be helpful for the fans. You know, like if he truly did something like really bad, which I would believe is not the case considering he came back after like only two games missed. I don't I, like, I think the fans would want to know that because they don't want to be supporting someone that's doing something that, you know, is bad. And obviously they're not going to jump to conclusions because there might be legal ramifications for that. And I understand that they need to take their time in doing certain things, but like, I just think a little bit more transparency would help. Like, Oh, it's a disciplinary thing that Kucho's out for like, Oh, it's an injury. Like just leaving it so vague is just, frustrating for fans to understand what's going on and it's not just the Cucho situation that's been like this I mean I think the biggest one is probably the Bruce Arena nobody I think at this point still has any idea what happened there and everybody just sees Bruce Arena now like ostracized from the league who's Bruce Arena is arguably the greatest MLS coach of all time and he no longer has a job in the league and there's so many question marks around it and there has been zero answers so I, I think i would like to see the league be a lot more transparent on these kinds of uh issues and, and talk about it a little bit more i'm not saying i need all the details all at once like immediately but a little bit would be helpful i would assume kind of wild you mentioned greatest MLS coach of all time and Chris Armas wasn't directly following that like I don't know to me personally I think that's that's wild but <laughs> whatever um but no you I, I think you're completely right he's so shelled up about this because it's a it's a trend in MLS right it's it's not I don't know if it's necessarily about him protecting his players because you know as a coach myself like when things happen internally we usually keep it between the players right and then if we have to and and everybody's getting so riled up about it, then we'll 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 hint at some things, but we're not just gonna come out and air any dirty laundry that's going on, you know, whether it be he dis disregarded team rules and you know went out partying the night before or whatever. But you know, you don't go out and just air dirty laundry, right? But there is this trend within MLS and, and teams in MLS in terms of lack of transparency. You know, it's not like you mentioned, it's not the first time this has happened. And I'm, I'm fairly certain it won't be the last time this has happened. Right. And, and let's let's go away from just the the players and the teams for a second. Let's talk about the league. How much gam or tam does Atlanta United have right now? Not, not <laughs> the a clue. The world may never know. Right. Not a clue. How, how much how much of their salary cap is, <laughs> is usable? Not a clue. Right. This is completely foreign to fans of NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL. I mean, there are literally websites dedicated to tracking the salary caps of teams. I, I remember going on for, I think it's like, a, it's capology. And then there's something a little bit more specific just for NHL. But you can literally go eight years into the future and figure out what the cap's going to be. And, how, and, and if, it, if it changes with a CBA or whatever, then it changes there. But you can go and predict exactly who's going to be a free agent and where it's going to go. And it, it keeps you engaged in, you know, off seasons and things like that. But they... To the cent, to the penny, you can understand what your favorite team in that league has to spend. And in MLS, are like, eh, don't worry about it. Like, and, I, and I'm going to explain in a second here. So th then we talk about the individual issues, right? Like last season, Bruce Arena administrative leave, we, we got a allegation of insensitive remarks. And then that was it. He was he was let go. He resigned. And then a few months later, he was reinstated. I believe. I think he's. I think he's been reinstated. He doesn't have a job, but he's been reinstated. Like he could if he wanted to. Now Cucho does something to get himself a two match ban. One of which is again one of the most important games in in the season, and nobody knows what happened. So I, I ask you here, what point? And you kind of hinted on it, but at what point does the lack of transparency become? A problem like are what things do we want to keep under wraps and what things do we want to keep 
you know, out in the open? What do we want people to know? It's a it's a difficult conversation because and, and I might be in, in the minority on this take, but I think how much you tell to the audience depends on the level of, I guess, stature the player has in the team. So like someone like Cucho is arguably the face of the team. He's one of the faces of the league, period. Like he is a top, top player. He has a lot of people that are fans of him. There's a lot of people that follow him just specifically, let alone the crew. If he is missing and he's healthy, people are going to ask questions. And I don't mean this. I'm not going to single out another person as as an opposite example because I don't want to throw any disrespect towards certain people. But if the, if we're talking about some like second string, third string striker that's healthy and is missing two games, People aren't asking questions about that. Like, and the team in that case is not going to have to provide answers because nobody's asking the questions. I think someone like Bruce Arena, someone like Cucho, people are going to ask the questions. And in that case, I think you you should give some kind of an answer. I don't, like you said, you don't need to air out all the dirty laundry. You know, there, there's a lot of key detail. Like, it would not look good if, if Nancy went into a press conference and just aired out everything that happened and whatever incident involved Kucha, like I agree. I think that would not be a good look, not be the right thing to do. But at the same time, I think the fans are owed at least something, some, some bit of an explanation as to what's going on. Is that, I mean, they're the ones that pay to go to watch the games. And, you know, if, if Kucho is going to be missing for like three more games, fans may not necessarily want to pay money to go watch. If Kucho is the one guy they're going to go watch. And now it's just kind of up in the air, like, oh, I don't know, like, what's going on with Cucho? Is he is he hurt? Like, is he suspended? Like, how long is he going to be out? I don't want to pay money if I want to go watch Cucho and then he's not going to play. So I, I think. I think there's there should be some kind of. Explanation to some regard to the fans, I, I don't like I like I said before, I don't, you don't need to air out all the details, but. If it's something disciplinary, just say it's like something disciplinary. It, it was a something involving team rules. It's it's an injury. It's a whatever else. It's a it's a you know it's an emergency situation. You don't even have to dive into like what caused the emergency situation, but just something. I'm kind of along the same path as you. I just don't I don't limit it to player specific, right? Like people will argue the same thing about like oh when Messi doesn't play, we should be told 24 hours in advance if Messi's not going to play. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that because one, you're tipping your hand to your opponent, right. Who might be game planning against a certain player. Um, and, and two, right. That's, that's you, these players, as much as they're here for entertainment, you, you, you can't, you can't market them around. Like they're the, they're the focus of what you're doing, right? Like if the only reason people are showing up is for one player, you can't just accept that and be like, oh, we're going to, we're going to run them out for 15 minutes. So make sure you show up for those 15 minutes. Right. Like, I think that's a little bit of a stretch, but I do agree with a, a little bit of what you're saying. So uh, again, I'm okay. If an in-house thing needs to be kept in-house for the most part, but if that thing leads to a dismissal, a termination, a fine, something that has repercussions, there should be a reason why that thing has been, has led to a, a repercussion. Right. So for example, right, let's go back to this idea of allegations of insensitive remarks right if two people violate that a coach player whatever and one person gets a fine and the other person resigns well now you're saying hey they both did the same thing why are the why are the punishments different right and that leads to a lot of uh, again lack of transparency and lack of understanding which can create dissent on the flip side of it in terms of the transparency and what needs to be transparent i mean these league rules and available cap that's a no-brainer like, there's no reason to me why we can't have a system in place that highlights what teams have, what they've spent, what they're able to spend, and what the future looks like in their in their spending. You know, again, I, as I mentioned, it engages fans in the offseason, right? I, I, I loved when I was growing up looking at NFL and, and, and NHL you know, salaries and being like, oh, who's the free agent? What is it going to cost them? How's that going to change things? It just keeps you a little bit involved. In, and again, the the difference in in soccer because it's a world game and you're you're paying transfer fees and things is it makes it a little bit tougher i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say it doesn't but it also allows for things if, if that's transparent 
it allows for things like the Galaxy or the Miami rule breaches to either be caught quicker or prevented altogether. And that is why I do think some of this lack of transparency is intentional. Because as the league tries to grow, it's not a question. We've seen it before. MLS will change its rules on a whim. David Beckham showed up and literally was here because he created a rule. Leo Messi very recently being paid by a league sponsor, probably never done, you know, to our knowledge in league history. We can go all the way back to 2015. Clint Dempsey's coming into the league. And usually you have to go through an allocation process, but he comes out and says, I only want to play in Seattle. Well, Seattle couldn't trade up in the allocation to get him or somebody was, you know, playing hardball, whatever. So instead of losing out on Clint Dempsey, MLS just midseason changes the rule and says, oh, American players of certain, certain thresholds, they can play wherever they want. They just get to pick wherever they get to go. All that is to say, at the end of the day, MLS rules, they restrict teams enough, right? We know that. We know that they need to change. We've talked about it before. But if they were made as clear as NFL and NHL, NBA, whatever, they were made that clear in public, it would be very, very difficult to make changes like that to allow players like Beckham, Messi, Dempsey. You know, now we think to the future, right? Pulisic wants to come back, let's say, for example, right? How do we make that work if our rules are restricting us to a point where that's not possible? If you just go ahead and then flip a rule and say, oh, well, now this this team gets to benefit from that, you know, that is going to cause a lot of problems. So I think the lack of transparency is intentional. Now, is that good or bad? I can see both sides, right? We're still growing. We're trying to put a foothold in in both the, the local and the league game, a really good foothold. But at the end of the day, there's there are reasons behind it. And and We'll see what happens. Time's going to tell if that's the right way to do things. We'll figure it out. But, you know, there, there's definitely a reason behind it. I do think it's a, it's a bit intentional that they're not just opening it up to the world, you know? I'm, I'm honestly okay with the league making those kind of spur of the moment changes to the rules. Sure. Because, because if they just stick with the rules, I think we're many steps behind where we are right now. If, if we're even still around at all, right? Like, Beckham probably like if they don't change the rules, Beckham doesn't come to the league. And and that probably sinks the league, if we're being honest. Like I think Beckham absolutely took this league, saved it, and put it to the next level. And would the league would not be where it is today without him. And same I mean, same thing with Dempsey too. It's like these things, while it may specifically benefit one team in that current moment, it's not like your team can't benefit from it in the future. So I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing for them to do that. I think it's good that they're they're being flexible because they just were so hard struck with sticking with the rules. Then I think things would change at a much slower pace than they need to because the league is developing really quickly. I mean, just look at where we were 10 years ago. It's crazy difference. Like it, it was a completely different league 10 years ago from where it is now. And so I think I think it's a good thing that they have that flexibility. Uh, I don't necessarily have a problem with them being a bit more transparent on the financials part of it. I think, you know, they publish the salaries for the players every year. And from like a Tam Gam perspective, um, I think if they made that public, it might make trades within the league a bit tougher. Is my thought process, because now if you're, let's say it's like Houston's trying to trade for a player from the galaxy, they can just look and see like, okay, the Galaxy has a million in Cam. Like, we know they can offer more money than what they're offering right now. So we're going to play hardball because we know what you have in your bank, basically. So I think could make things a little bit harder with the intra-league moves. Um, Not saying that moves wouldn't happen. Obviously, they would still happen. But I'm not necessarily against them being a little bit more untransparent with the financials and and if they make all this stuff public i still think teams are going to find ways to get around it it's not like people in the league aren't checking these like rules like uh, to make sure that people are following the rules correctly it's if that were the case we would never find out about miami like it would have never been caught so obviously people are checking maybe not to the same like to the frequency that we need them to but there are people checking things to make sure that teams aren't just having six DPs on their team. 
Sure. And, and, and like I said, there, there are ways to improve on that sort of stuff. That's definitely one of the things that we can talk about in, in terms of improvement. Um, and I don't disagree. I, I don't have a problem with them being flexible on rules like that, that can make drastic changes to what we're doing here. The problem is right. If to me, if you make it super transparent, that ability to make those flexible changes goes away or becomes a lot harder. That's kind of where I'm, I'm going from that. So, you know, again, there's good and bads to both sides of that, right? The other side of it is, well, we don't know how much anything is. And now I need to figure out what GAM is and DPs are and U22s. And I got to figure all this stuff out. And I don't even, I don't want to care anymore. I'm just going to go watch something else, right? There's, there's goods and bads on both sides, but um, let us know what you think on, on things like that. We love all your comments and interactions. That's something I've been interested about before because transparency is, is, is an issue in the league for sure. Um, but how much of an issue? We'll, we'll, we'll transition then into yet another unveiling of a beautiful, and I know Connor's going to talk all about how much it looks <laughs> like it's wonderful, soccer-specific stadium for the New England Revolution. Because on Tuesday, everyone's favorite NFL owner, he remembered that he actually owned a soccer team. And then he went to Beacon Hill to make a case to build its, its own stadium, which is crazy because you, you could have you could have probably asked him seven or eight times over the last couple of years. He would have been like, what's a revolution? Who is trying to revolt? <laughs> but anyways, uh, they are looking to build it on the on the uh, right on right in Everett, Massachusetts, and they dropped renderings of the stadium. Now, before we get into it, I just do want to quell Connor's inevitable comment about its appearance by saying that they have made it very clear that it is just an initial rendering. They are going to make more changes to it. It's going to look a little bit better. It's not the finished design. So Connor, hold on to those tears for later because it's not happening right now. I listen, I I'm on board with the stadium because it's a gimmick isn't a cube entrance. Oh my <laughs> lord. You're ridiculous. But I do want to let go, I'm going to let you continue. Please tell me your thoughts on the design, the location, you know, what, what do you think? Are you happy? Yeah, it's it's great. I mean, it, Gillette Stadium has been uh, like, obviously, you could seat a lot of people, but, you know, current New England Revolution isn't going to pull in exactly a huge crowd right now. Uh, but no, it's it's great. I think the more soccer specific stadiums we have, the better. Uh, you know, obviously, there are exceptions where non soccer specific stadiums work out for teams like Atlanta, where the the having that bigger capacity to fit in a bunch of people is really really great and makes the atmosphere really strong there and a really tough place to play if you're an away team but uh in the cases like new england where it's just not necessarily the the same situation i think a soccer specific stadium is great and uh i mean like you said it's very early days like i don't want to take too much from just like a sketch they essentially created for the stadium because they're not going to make an ugly looking sketch, right? Like they're what's the, in 2024, they're not creating an ugly looking stadium in a, their like first sketch of it. Like it's going to, of course, look good. And it does. It looks really good. It looks great. It looks like it's a, a whole thing to walk around, except for like the industrial plant that's right next to it. That's a little weird, but that's beyond the fact. Uh, but I think it's great. It, it looks good. I think the location, I'm not going to like, dive too much into the location i'm not a massachusetts person they can talk on that a little bit more but it seems to be pretty close to boston uh but just outside of it which i think is probably probably pretty good i would imagine it's probably not too difficult to go from boston to everett uh and they have like the boat path that you can get there which is really interesting i i guess a lot of people or enough people in massachusetts own a boat that they decided to make a boat entrance for the stadium. But I mean, whatever works. Um, but yeah, it, it's good. I think it's an all around good thing for the team. And Lord knows they need something to look forward to right now, because this team, other than the fact that they just barely beat Charlotte at home, um, has been dreadful this year. A couple of interesting points there, like, that you that you made because I, I i believe the industrial part is being taken down like i think that's mm -hmm. part of the 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 revival plan um but i also very interesting like revs pull a good crowd it just seems small because their stadium is like eighty thousand big so it just yeah feels but, that's, but that's what i that's what i mean though it's like it, it would be better in the soccer specific stadium because then it'll look packed and the atmosphere will be better 
Correct. Yeah. And, and that's that's exactly what what my kind of thought is. Right. It's half of it's, it's five miles outside of Boston. They are within they're on the water. It's you know, they're hoping to extend the metro line of that that uh, again, not like you, not a Boston person. So whatever the I, I want to call it a subway line, but I don't think it's a subway line. But the, yeah, the, the metro, train line. Yeah, train, train line. line. Yeah, yeah, metro line, whatever. Metro you, line. Yeah, you get great. the idea. Um, there's a still, still LIRR clears, right? Like, um, but yeah, it, it's it's right on the water, it's it's going to be walking distance to an extended metro line. It's the perfect idea design for a metro team, right? Always going to be super expensive and require a lot of convincing and political red tape and blah blah blah. blah. Go straight into Boston and do this. So, this I think is a really good second option. And it allows for some unique opportunities, right? So firstly, under 100 parking spots for cars, which are probably just going to be players and you know game day staff, right? Huge increase in public transit. And that in and of itself, in my opinion, good move, right? Game day traffic is, is you know, coming from a guy who's driven to RBA more times than I'd like to admit, is a nightmare. And it is honestly one of the reasons why people are just like, yeah, I'm not even going to bother showing like i'm not going to show up i'll watch it at home because i don't want to deal with the four hours of traffic to drive you know 30 miles so to to funnel it all through a a public transportation system that runs on a set schedule you know exactly when it's going to show up you know exactly when it's going to leave i I think it's a great again in it for a metro area team i think it's a great idea um Likewise, uh, you mentioned the water transport, I think is super unique and it, and it, it involves, it can be just something super niche for this team, right? Um, in Pittsburgh, you've got like the gateway clipper shuttle service that will take you from mainland Pittsburgh over to the the games on this steamboat, basically. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a big party boat, like it's a big, like big to do, but it's also another way to get to the stadium without having to drive over and pay for parking. Like, I think it's like a $15 round trip to get on this thing and go. So you pay for parking on the mainland or you take the, the, the public transport there and then ferry on over again, just unique, different, cool. Something you don't see for MLS teams. Right. Uh, and then like New York city's plan, like it comes with an improved community restoration, right? Public park, $10 million for housing stabilization, which not defined in the article, but again, can only be, you know, it only sounds like a good thing, right? Uh, and it, it also says that the stadium would be open to other teams and like band practices and things like that. So it's a community thing too, which is nice. Um, on the flip side of it, right? Difficulties are going to be rewriting those zoning laws so that they can turn it from the industrial site into the stadium. Funding, of course, and the transportation and again, overall improval, right? How are we going to share the revenue with the the surrounding area, right? Because that's always a big thing is, oh, you're going to put a stadium here. We want to cut, right? So you're using all of our people and whatever we want to cut. So how are they going to spread that out? That's going to be a, that's going to be a, an interesting way to do this. But um, like you mentioned it before, and we said it with New York City, and we say it with pretty much every, every time we see one of these teams move from a non-soccer specific stadium to a soccer specific stadium is that this is good. Like location, price, whatever. It's good. The and it's it's not only good for the league, but it's good for the game in the country, right? Having specific places that are soccer only is good. Revs usually getting around twenty to twenty five thousand in the game, in the door every day, every game. So playing in a twenty five to thirty k soccer specific stadium is going to make that atmosphere intense. It's going to make it really, really united it's going to be really really nice to watch that happen um and again i don't i don't really care about the design i'm gonna be honest with you like if it looks bad whatever people aren't going to be there like oh that looks ugly i'm not gonna go watch my team play no like that's not happening but in in this day and age soccer specific stadiums is very important and this is one of the teams that has to have one um so i think it's great it's a great sign i think uh, unless you have any other you know, disagreements or or things that you're worried about. The only other thing I'm worried about, and it was a point that you mentioned earlier in your conversation was the, the transportation to the stadium. Mm -hmm. You'd mentioned the the lack of parking. So it's going to be a lot more public transport. Uh, I think the reality is you're going to see a lot of ride share services is going to be very common. Uh, A lot of Ubers, a lot of Lyfts, all that stuff. If there is only like what, because you had mentioned them needing to extend 
the metro line to get mm -hmm. here. But there's only one way, like one metro line that is going to the stadium. I'm not gonna lie, that sounds just as much of a nightmare as driving and having to deal with stadium traffic which i agree is a nightmare and it sucks and it would be great if they had more public transport but even something like city field where yes it's only one subway line that's going there but you also have the long island railroad that's going there as well uh and there might be other stuff as well there's probably buses and whatnot and that might be the case for here too maybe there's bus lines or something that go here but hopefully if they're going to limit the amount of parking that's at the stadium, they actually invest in like good public transportation for people to go there because being on a absolutely packed in subway or like Metro line is not very fun. I, I, I don't know if it's something that would stop someone from going to a game, maybe a few people, probably not as much as like stadium traffic, but it would still, I think, be a benefit for them to really invest in the public transport there if you're going to really, like, push that onto the fans and say, like, okay, there's no parking, so find another way to get to the stadium. I'll have to, I'll have to reserve to you, city boy, because I don't... I don't. I don't know what a train is. I'll be honest. Yeah, you did ride the cows to the. <laughs> since, no since my time, since my time back in Yeehaw Land, I haven't seen a train <laughs> in years. Um, no, but I think that's a fair point, right? Like, if it's as much of a headache to get over, because here's the thing, too, right? Let's let's think about it. If you are only going to have one line, and that line goes down, you need to repair it or whatever. Well, now now you're in trouble, right? Now you're now you're looking at. What the heck was that? <laughs> Sorry, I tried to mute and then for well, some reason unmuted. I well, was trying... <laughs> forget the mute. Like you just got really close. <laughs> there was something on my keyboard. I was trying to blow it off my keyboard. <laughs> Such a freak. Um, yeah, no, but like you were saying, not only is the 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 difficulty of being on a packed line going to be something that might be bad. If you only have one line and that line goes down that's another whole issue, right? Like that's, I, I remember um, we went to the playoff game, Pop, me, Pops, and Jason, and um, we drove in because there was rumors that one of the lines going in was down and it made travel just an absolute nightmare. And that's that's another problem. Especially, you know, Luckily, Red Bull has tons of other parking areas and parking garage and whatever. Um, and we got to meet Andrew Wiebe, which was cool. But... <laughs> Very interesting way to meet him. <laughs> it was a great, it was a great meetup. It was the, it was the post meetup <laughs> that, that got interesting. Um, but no, like if, if that is, if you're going to take away all of those parking options, say this is the only way to get it, you better have multiple lines. Otherwise you're, you're in trouble. If, if again, something freak goes down or scheduled maintenance or things just get too packed and people don't want to do it. And they, they have other options. Cause again, I think of the LIRR to the subway, right? Like, you have to take the train in to get onto the subway to take the line in. Like, it's not a direct path. So people would have to take multiple metro lines in. Might not want to do that if it's a nightmare to get in on that on that one line, right? It, it might deter them from it. So no, totally fair point. I like that. No, I, I'll, I'll say that uh, I would love to go to many more Mets games and all the stuff around City Field, but it is an absolute nightmare for me to get there from, from Brooklyn. So... To have to like go into Manhattan, cut all the way out to Queens. Like, and I remember last year when I met up with Matt to go to the NYC game for the for decision day, it would they they closed us only a section of the the line that goes into Queens, the seven line, mm -hmm. and it was just an absolute nightmare getting to the stadium. Like, every single line was packed, and I had to transfer like three times to just get to the state. Like, it was such a nightmare that I I, I was like. Maybe I should just get like a sixty dollar Uber home because it'll be easier. I didn't know. I don't think I ultimately ended up doing that, but it. Uh, yeah, I mean, to your point, I don't think they would schedule maintenance if there's a game going on that day. But to your point, if something happens to the line, and that's the only way to get there, then I guess nobody's coming to the game, right? Well, and, and think about like you mentioned that, right? Like when I take when I when I take public transit in, it's um, Huntington to. Um, Penn Station, then it's transfer into the path to take that to um, 
trying to think where I transfer on the path. It's been a Jersey while since City, it, Newark. I think it, I, I don't I don't know if it's Newark or if it's World Trade Center. It might be the one before World Trade Center. Christopher Newport, maybe is that the name of it? Can't I can't remember. It's it, literally it's been eight years now since I've done that. I've driven in every other time, but I transfer there before I get the one to to Harrison. So it's like, it's great because there's a station that goes right up to Red Bull Arena. You just walk across a bridge and you're there. But for a lot of us to take all of those transfers to get in, that's that's tough. And then, like I said, you, you have freak things that go on, like a bull running down the uh, double hard tracks, like r- the most <laughs> random stuff. Do you see that? No, I didn't. You I haven't seen it? Oh, dude, I, I got to show it to you. I'll send it to you after we're done recording. The Smithtown Bull is loose. Bro, I don't know where, I don't know what. Uh, station it was at, but there was literally a a bull ho- bull with the horns like out here, just running down the railroad track. All the trains had to stop. Everybody was delayed like two hours before they caught the damn thing. And I was like, it was like a week or two before the Red Bull season started. Like this is either a really good omen or we are screwed. That was just a crazy marketing event, <laughs> event from Red Bull. That's what <laughs> that's it was. What we go, we go. Oh, finally, Red Bull Global doing some marketing in New York City. <laughs> the um, Red Bull is on the loose. <laughs> Well, there was actually a little petition like, yo, somebody should like make that our way, bring it to the stadium, make it our mascot. And they returned it to whatever wildlife sanctuary came from, whatever. But again, <laughs> random things happen in New York and, and in, in Boston and metro areas that you just can't plan for. See, you should have multiple, multiple ones, right? Oh, that's let's that get. Really I feel like we should get to the last topic because this oh, one's going to be like an hour long. No, but like. that was, we needed to talk about the bull. No, it's fine. I, I'm fine talking about the bowl, but yes. I, I'm I'm trying to be conscious of time and, and allow us to have our full thoughts on this oh, last topic. Relax about time, because what we had to do was take a lot of time to wrangle that bull and take it by the horns. And that's what we're going to do with this next next topic is take this topic by the horns. No, nope, didn't <laughs> like it. Didn't like <laughs> it. That felt that's like all right. You have bad taste. We know you have bad taste. It's OK. All right. We are going to transition into a topic that has always been kind of on the forefront of our conversations, but has been more so on the front of the last couple of weeks. Uh, And that's the disrespect of the league through its next pro affiliates. So two different topics we're going to cover. First one is FCC's rebranding of their FCC two to Commonwealth United. And the other one is the idea of the MLS Next Pro sides not performing well in the U.S. Open Cup. Um, so uh, I may butcher this name, and I'm going to apologize in advance, but Kartik Krishnayer. But he's a senior writer at World Soccer Talk, and he is as anti-MLS as one can get. And he goes on as FCC announced that Commonwealth United is going to be the new name of their um, next pro side as other teams begin their rebrand and, and start to take this path. We've covered that in another episode, right? And he goes on and says, by the way, this isn't going to be the only one was planning on doing a notebook feature for BT 90. I guess that's a, a different uh, thing that he writes for um, in the near future about p- potential rebrands of MLS next pro co- clubs. They're coming. This one is particularly audacious as USL already has two professional sides in Kentucky. And this is the whole thing. And I'm going to try and not go down too many rabbit holes here, but this is why anybody who has like a bit of reading comprehension doesn't enjoy being on Twitter for these conversations because the tweets are worded so specifically so that people who don't want to read or do any research on it just instantly buy into it. Right. Already has two professional clubs in Kentucky. Yes, they do. Lexington FC and Louisville City, right? Never once do they mention who the two teams are, where they're located, what divisions they're in. (laughs) And then they go ahead and say that this team is trying to kill them off without mentioning the fact that FCC2, which has been around a couple of years after FCC's entrance into the league, has been playing at the same exact place that this Commonwealth United is going to be playing for the last, like, four years. They First of all, shifting from MLS, because people aren't buying into your MLS, anti-MLS takes, down to the next pro team because that's the new hot thing, is lazy. It's a lazy take, right? And and then people are like, oh, yeah, World Soccer Talk doesn't have an anti-MLS buy it. Shut up. 
we need to, I'm going to emphasize this really, really importantly, right? This is not, this whole section is not going to be us trying to give MLS pass on some of its past decisions, claim that it's perfect and doesn't need to be changed, right? We are not doing any of that. But if you're going to try and take a shot at a league or its affiliate or whatever it may be, do some research and have some merit behind it, right? The same people who claim that they want to see the game grow in this country are finding any way possible to discredit the league that is working the hardest or at least as hard as everybody else to improve it at the top. And now we're focusing on bringing soccer to more areas in the country that don't have teams. And the people who are relatively well-known in American soccer as personalities are using it to take shots at, at, at the league and get clicks on social media and a little bit of clout, which is a damn shame. Lexington and Louisville, D2 and D3 sides respectively, are 80 and 100 miles away from where FCC2 is going to be playing or soon to be Commonwealth United, will be playing their games in Northern Kentucky University. A hundred miles. How in the world do we see that as intentionally trying to, to take over pro soccer in Kentucky? It's ridiculous. And I'll, I'll take a break here and have a breath and I'll let you go at it. But I mean, like, unbelievable. Sorry, go ahead. So I've got a couple of thoughts on this as well. Uh, first of all, as you mentioned before, these aren't necessarily like just new teams from MLS Next Pro that are just popping up out of the blue. Like they've been around. A lot of them have been in these locations or very close to it. And yet, despite all of that, USL Championship had 75% of their teams have a year over year increase in attendance in 2023. So I don't understand how all of a sudden, because they're rebranding, they're murdering USL and they're never going to survive. And MLS just wants to be the only league in, in America and all that mumbo jumbo. Um, on top of that, if there were the case that a bunch of teenagers, 16, 17, 18 year olds are putting your club out of business, I think there are much bigger problems at hand than these MLS next pro teams potentially ruining your attendance and ruining your club. I think there are, if that is the case, there are many other issues at play. It is not just the fact that some teenagers are playing soccer near you near, uh, now. So there, there are a lot of things to look at here and uh, none of them are being looked at with this tweet. I think there, it, it sounds like it's just trying to garner outrage towards anything MLS related. And I think it is missing the mark. It, it, and, and again, this is why I laugh when they're like, oh, yeah, they don't have an anti MLS bias. And then they do stuff like this. Right. Because it, it's exactly what it is. it's for clicks. They know exactly what they're doing. And they say, oh, look, an MLS next pro team is trying to be an independent team. And it's in Kentucky, which means they're trying to take over all of Kentucky when you know damn well, that's not the case. But they know that there's a there's a Twitter hive out there that's like anything that MLS does has to be terrible. So we're going to jump on it and give you clicks. Right. And that's that's a huge problem. But I, I agree. Reiterating the point that we made two episodes, three episodes ago. Right. If MLS is rebranding their third division development league side with teenagers and like a few over 23s, it is capable of bankrupting one of the most successful teams in USL championship in the last half decade, at least maybe longer who has their own soccer-specific stadium that has a women's team, a youth development program, has put players into Europe, right? We've got players coming out of Louisville, Josh Widener, who's in Europe right now. If Commonwealth United, who's been there five years, just changes their name and suddenly bankrupts you, we've got other problems to talk about. And it's not the fact that we've changed the name of a team, right? By the way, doing it 100 miles away. <laughs> that That's the other big part of this, right? I can't think of a single person who's like, oh, yeah, you know, 100 miles. It's like it's probably like an hour and a half drive. I can make that trip <laughs> if, if I'm doing it, especially on a weekday. Like I could probably make that trip or I could stay here and watch from home. And I could also just watch a, a development team for the pro. Um, oh, wait, no, I'm only five miles outside of Cincinnati itself. I'm just going to go that way. Like, where where is the logic there? <laughs> Like, I'm going to drive 100 miles an hour and a half down to watch USL Championship, or I'm going to drive 15 miles up and watch a, a, an MLS side that's doing relatively well right now. Why do they think that just having it in that area is going to kill it? I don't know, right? But 
I am getting tired of this broad paintbrush of generalities being used to paint everything MLS does as bad. Just because somebody online who pays for Twitter says it's bad. Like, we're really out here using a platform that this guy has, Kartik, with between him and his world soccer talk. I don't know if it's his company or if he's just a big writer. I know he's a writer. I don't know if he, like, started or whatever. Combined, they're almost at 100,000 followers. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're here to, we're here to grow the game, right? We're, we want to we make everything better. We want to grow the, the lower leagues and whatever. And they're just out here doing zero research, tweeting and writing articles for clicks that pushes the narrative that soccer isn't legit in America because it's not done in a certain way or, or, or people are doing it the wrong way, right? And maybe in your mind, you're like, oh, this is good. If I don't like soccer, if I don't like MLS, people are going to watch USL and USL is going to grow and it's going to be the big thing. No. People are going to stop watching MLS. 5% of them are going to go to USL. The rest of them, Premier League. And guess what? Those people are then going to become the next group of, well, it's not the Premier League, so why am I watching? Right? That doesn't grow the game. It doesn't. And I'm scrolling through these tweets of anti-MLS accounts that are pushing USL like super hard these days. Like everybody needs to watch USL. It's on CBS. It's on Golazo. It's on this, on that. And it just reminds me of like MLS 2.5, right? MLS is getting a little bit of traction. We've got some good players. We've got a TV deal. And it's, it's ours. Like, it's our thing, right? And everybody in that time was trying to convince their friends, like, hey, watch MLS a little bit. It's a good time. It's not the Premier League, but it's fun. Every tweet that I'm seeing now is, yeah, USL isn't that good, but it's ours. Like, we should watch it. It's getting so much better, this, that, and the other. They're just 20 years behind the curve. They just want to go back and be like, oh, yeah, look, we found this niche thing called USL, and we were here first. And we want to make it cool by saying that thing's not cool, but our thing's cool. And you should all come on our side. That's that's all it is. Is people just trying to be like the 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 first people to do something. And I'm not out here being like, oh, USL needs to die. Because I think it's really like there are some really fun games. There are really good teams in there. Nisa was the same way. I enjoyed watching Nisa when I could. But to enjoy one thing at the expense of another and trying to take down another is really silly, in my opinion. Like I am I'm I'm one of those people who can watch anything all the time. If it's if it's soccer, I enjoy it. I don't understand the whole oh man, we can't like MLS if we're going to if we're going to like USL. Or we can't like USL if we're going to like MLS. Like it's football. Enjoy it. Watch it all. Pick seven different teams and follow them. I don't care. But they they like being a a relatively well followed account and using it to drag down what is I don't even think it's arguably anymore, the most successful American soccer league in history. And using your platform to tear it down instead of bring everybody else up is one of the, is a really bad reason to, to be where you're at. Like it just, again, I can go down a whole bunch of this and and it, it would end just, just being word vomit because it's going to be the same thing repeated over and over again. I just think they do it all for the wrong reason and it has zero research behind it. It's all for clicks. And I hate that. Because clickbaiting things doesn't Im- improve things; it only brings things. Yeah, I don't. I don't see how the goal is to is to bring up soccer in the country when the only thing you're suggesting is that we tear down one of the leagues. There, I, how does that build up soccer in the country? How is that benefiting or improving soccer in the country at all? Like, sure, like you said, maybe it helps USL like one or two percent, but. In the grand scheme of things, soccer in this country goes down drastically. Like it probably kills soccer in this country, to be honest with you. Probably just kills it permanently. And and the like you said, the Premier League is now just like the full like the the only focus here. Like uh, even if they don't go to the Premier League, they're gonna be like, all right, whatever. I'm gonna go watch basketball. I'm gonna watch football. I'm gonna watch baseball. I'm gonna watch hockey. Like there's a million other things that they can go do. Uh, so yeah, I I don't think. They're just taking down MLS is not moving the needle towards improving soccer in this country at all. No. And and this the, the whole conversation, and I don't want to dive down into it, but the, I think the whole conversation is about it's heading right in the direction of pro rel. It's the same thing every single time. Whenever someone's talking about wanting to improve USL and MLS is trying to kill USL, it's all related to the pro rel because they want USL to be stronger so that they can build the pyramid because that's what Europe does. And, Europe is successful and pro rel is the only way that we could be successful in this country because 
uh, all of a sudden millions of people are just going to jump on board as soon as MLS gets pro rail. Yeah, the you know, and and I don't even I didn't even take this down a pro rail thing because that's a whole nother argument, right? But they don't. It, it's almost like they don't want to see it succeed unless they were the first ones to do it. Do you know what I mean? Like they would rather go back twenty years, set it, go back to MLS two point days where, um, go back, you know, go back to okay stadiums, okay players not so much money in the game just so that they can say, Oh yeah, I was here when, and then see it grow up to this whole thing instead of actually just improving it and, and, and bring it all together up. Right. Cause like you mentioned, if you tear MLS down, the only thing that's happened is we're going back 20 years and we're restarting, which some people have outwardly come out and been like, yeah, that's what I want to do. Which is insane. Which is mental, 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 mental. And, and again, just to wrap this one section up, this is not us defending MLS to the to the bone, right? Like they have done tons of not great things. We are we, we've covered them already. We've talked about them already. You can go back and watch some other things. They've done not great stuff for monetary reasons, for personal reasons, whatever. But to come out and be like, oh, they're trying to kill everything in USL because they're putting. MLS next pro teams a hundred miles away with a new name is lazy. It's lazy and it's tired. It's a lazy and tired. You can, you can probably put together an argument about some of their actions hurting USL. Is it intentionally to kill them? No. And we've had that conversation already. You can go watch that too. But this specific take is lazy and, and, and really, really tired. And to continue on this this theme of relatively not so great takes, we, we we turn to Sebastian Salazar in the Football Americas podcast, but he comes out and, and had a forty second clip on MLS Next Pro teams bowing out of the U.S. Open Cup to a bunch of amateur sides, uh, and he uses it as a statement against MLS and its U.S. Open Cup stance. And to me, this one's a little bit different. So much like the Garber uh, comments in the past, where we broken down kind of what he said and what we think he meant. That's kind of what I've, I've gone to, to do here. So first and foremost, it's, it's a 40 second clip. Sebastian Salazar is essentially becoming the anti MLS version of Alexi Lawless, right? He's going out there and he's saying anything he wants against MLS that he knows that will get the anti MLS Twitter hive buzzing around and, and engaging and all this stuff just, just to get clicks. Right. And he goes on this mini rant after eight of the 11 MLS Next Pro sides were, were bounced out of the competition, and he says four at the hands of, of amateur sides. His first reference is to Garber's comment about MLS Next Pro being the only place kids can play soccer, and if it didn't exist, nobody would be playing soccer. We've addressed this comment before. We did it on, on that exact comment, that exact statement. We went through the whole thing and, and broke it down. His comment, taken out of context in, in this scenario and in the scenario before, was about the uber 1%, or the, the 0.001%, who could either play at the top level in America, Europe, or or other sports in general, because USL was was never really an option for them, right? Is it the correct comment to make? No. And, and I think we know that as soccer grows, all levels are going to be viable because USL started to put teams in, or players in Europe, um, and, and it seems like those are going to be the two pathways, and that's fine. And that's going to change, and I think the, the comment by Garber there was wrong, totally fine. But here's where I have the problem. He follows that up by saying, maybe they really shouldn't be playing at all. If you're a person whose entire platform over the last five months has been about America growing the game, America needs pro rel so that people can can engage with it and we can make the you know stronger from the ground up, right? And MLS needs to be in US Open Cup because that's what it's all about. It makes the game better. It makes it makes it 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 all across the the country. Everybody wants to be engaged in the US Open Cup. And then you come back because a bunch of kids from MLS Next Pro lost to adults in, a, in an Open Cup game who were just physically stronger than them, who weren't playing the best football while MLS Next Pro is about development and teaching them how to play a certain style. And your suggestion, because they've lost to four amateur adult teams, is quit altogether? Are we kidding? Like, how is that going to grow the game if we take people who are playing in some of the top developmental academies in the world or in the country? And just saying, yeah, quit because you lost a bunch of amateurs who are nine years older than you. Now, what I think he meant to say, and I'm going to ask you about this in a second, is that they shouldn't be playing in the U.S. Open Cup. 
which is a completely different conversation and maybe a fair point. But with his phrasing and the specific clipping of this section was something that he knew would stir engagement and get impressions on Twitter. This is one of the reasons why I think that football is going to be held back in this country because people are more concerned about having a big following with people who will take dumps on, on the league and, and all the things that are bad instead of actually addressing issues and, and commenting on it. I'm going to, and I'm, I have a point to that, but I want to, I want to take your, I want to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, that's, it's the low hanging fruit of MLS Twitter is just to jump on board and say all these bad things about MLS. Cause it's just really easy. Like you said, if you start doing that, you're going to be surrounded by the crowd of people that agree with you. And, because it's not a big crowd, they will gather up together and support each other. And it's easy to get engagement in that regard. But I think the real way to go about these things is to have like proper criticism about things like, like you said before, like uh, the league is far from perfect. We've talked a number of times about all the things they've done wrong with us open cup and the way they've handled that. And I think that's the proper way to go about it is to, not say like we should just completely abolish like the league should not be involved at all. We all this stuff, bad things about MLS and get rid of the league entirely and all this stuff. But I think the the real conversation needs to be had about like where like where things went wrong, how things can be improved, not necessarily just burn it all to the ground immediately. And 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 this clip really the more I dug into it, the more I got frustrated with it, right? So he finishes a little clip by by referencing U.S. Open Cup finally. He got, it took him 30 seconds to talk about U.S. Open Cup, which is the, the, the premise of what he was talking about, saying that MLS Next Pro teams losing is, is definitely what the Cup needed. And you, you could tell the tone in his voice was sarcastic and condescending. And this is where I lose a lot of respect for the clip, right? So all year long, since the decision of MLS to pull out of the U.S. Open Cup, we've been hearing that U.S. Open Cup is special because it's different from any other thing we have outside of maybe March Madness as we're in you know, the last stages of March Madness right now. It gives lower league soccer teams the ability and players the ability to play against teams in, in great you know, leagues above them and, and pull up upsets and MLS pulling away takes away all of that and it ruins it. And then they put their, their next pro sides in and, and that is just the, the worst thing in the world, which is not great, right? We, we've talked about why that's not great. But now we've got amateur teams, teams that are just, Part-time players, they show up, they play games, maybe they have a training session once a week. One of them's named after a burrito place, dude. Like, a California burrito place put a team together in an amateur division, won whatever the, the I think it was in California, whatever the California qualifying was, and now have taken down an MLS Next Pro side and a USL League One side. Both of them professionals in their own way. And instead of being excited about that and, and raising them up and, oh my God, look at this team that's making all of these great runs, we're using it as a way to 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 dunk on teenagers who are playing their first real competitive game. And this is why I got upset because I thought maybe this was just a clip of him ending it. And in the beginning of the episode, he was like, oh man, like this, this team, uh, Farolito from California going on this great run. Here's what they did. You want to know what the, so the, the clip was posted on April 4th. So I thought it was either a preview kind of like we do for our episodes or a, a post clip like we do for our episodes. So I went back and I looked at the episodes that they were talking about. The episode before this clip was posted, the topics were Tyler Adams' man of the match performance at Bournemouth, which was a fraud because he should have given Everton a penalty, but we won't go down that road. Uh, the week past of NWSL and the Canadian Premier League. So I'm like, okay, maybe it's a preview. I look at the, the episode after. They clickbaited Messi's Messi-less Miami losing to the Champions Cup. Messi's post-match scuffle with Monterey. MLS's poor performance in Champions Cup. U.S. Women's National Team She Believes Cup. And the Copa del Rey final. Eight different topics, not a single one about U.S. Open Cup, which means that at the very end of, because he says it in the clip, I want to leave you with this note. So at the very end of whatever episode this came from, he decided to just go completely off script and take a dunk on the MLS Next Pro setup because he knew that it was going to give him clicks and he knew he was going to get engagement. And again, nothing to do with anything they were talking about, which is, again, weird. But... It's just so disappointing that when people who have this sort of following will worry more about getting clicks for their show than actually engaging in that issue, right? And I get it. It's their job. But when your whole platform is about improving the game and, and making U.S. Open Cup what it's supposed to be and whatever, and the only thing you're doing is a 40-second clip to dunk on 
the MLS Next Pro group that lost, thinking, again, going back and thinking, oh, if enough people don't like MLS, then they're going to go watch USL and we're going to make it all better. As we mentioned, no. You know that that's not going to happen because otherwise they'd be there already. They're, USL is in all the smaller markets that people say, oh, MLS could have gone to smaller markets and and instead they only went to the big ones, right? Fair. There are some of them, like Louisville, for example, who have a great following and would have been great in MLS. That's not the case all over the country. It's a very small percentage of the, the, the small areas that do well, right? MLS has so much wrong with it. MLS Next Pro has so much wrong with it. You want to be upset with MLS not playing in the U.S. Open Cup? Fine. Fair game. We've, we, we've mentioned that already. You want to be upset with MLS Next Pro having D3 sanctioning and playing in the U.S. Open Cup? You can make that case too, right? I don't know if the Premier League, like for example, the Premier League second division, I don't know if they've got sanctioning. I think they're on their own little, you know, one-off, right? I think in Germany and Spain, you have some of the, the second teams playing in the pyramid, but they can't get up to the first division or the second division um, just by by ruling of the league, right? You can complain about that all you want. No, no problems whatsoever. Right. But if your only thing is going to use a 40 second clip to dunk on the performance of teenagers against adults, instead of giving praise to those amateurs that just got an upset, by the way, in that clip, if you listen very closely of the four amateur teams that got those upsets, not a single team had their name mentioned. Not a single player was like, oh, look at the way this guy stood out and and should be getting looks from USL one sides or whatever. Never which tells you what the intention of the clip was, which was disappointing. And again, now I look back at it, I feel kind of bad. We're giving him the engagement he wanted, right? Which, whatever. But these are the reasons the game is going to get held back in the country. Not because MLS does it one way and USL does it the same way, but with a little bit less money into it. It's the fact that people are too busy trying to tear down everything, right? The soccer wars, as, as we, we reference it, they're too busy trying to tear each other down. And again, MLS probably does a little bit more on, on USL too than, than we like to, to admit, whatever. But if the people who are having these sorts of conversations, instead of talking about the actual issues, are just doing it for engagement, which the last two examples, I believe, show that, this is not how we grow the game. It's how we drag it backwards. And it will take us exponentially longer to get to a point where we'd like to be. It's just disappointing, really, to me, that this this is the way that they're going about it. That's quite the rant you had there. Sorry, I got I got excited. I I get to hell. I actually no, I didn't get excited. I got disappointed. When I get disappointed, I get defensive. I could see that. Um, I wanted to I wanted to talk about another competition that goes on in because there was a point in that statement that you were talking about where it's it's MLS Next Pro sides are playing like garbage and getting beat by USL sides and amateur sides and. My point here with this is that this shouldn't necessarily be surprising. And, and the example I want to use is the EFL trophy in, in everybody's favorite league, England. The EFL trophy is for League One and League Two, but included in that are academy sides. All the Premier, not all the Premier League, but there are a number of Premier League U21 sides that are involved in this competition. Looking at the 2023-2024 EFL trophy, uh, it's a little bit little bit different than U.S. Open Cup because they do group stages before they get to the knockouts. In the group stages, there is a U21 side in all of the groups. There's there's one side in every single group. Six out of the 16 U, uh, U21 sides were able to get out of the group, or basically first or second in the group. Only one team finished top of their group, so five out of the six uh, that made it through were second place. And the other 10 got eliminated. Within the next round, only two teams, which is the round of 32, only two U21 sides made it past the round of 32. So I don't understand why it's so shocking or surprising that an MLS Next Pro side is struggling against teams that are basically like our third and fourth tier in the US. Like If you really want to put it into a pyramid, USL 1, USL 2, third and fourth tier like there of course there are upsets in there as well like the semi-professional teams are obviously going to be at a lower level than like league one or league two in england right like upsets will happen it's a bunch of teenagers playing it's going to happen but majority of the time it's it's like usl 
like if if these MLS next pro teams are losing to third, fourth tier sides in the US, then it's like, why is this so surprising when the exact same thing is happening in, in England? You know, past the round of 30, like majority of the time, these teams are not winning. And even the few teams that made it to the round of 32, a few of them got absolutely blown out, like four zero, three zero losses in their knockout games there. I think even out of the two that moved on, only one made it to the quarterfinals. And then that was it. They were all out beyond that point. So like, it shouldn't have been this expectation that MLS Next Pro was just going to come in here because they have the MLS tag. They were just going to wipe the floor with everybody. Like it's like it's a bunch of 16, 17, 18, 19 year old kids playing against people who are like in their 30s. It's it's going to be a, like there's going to be plenty of cases where they're going to lose. So I don't think that that's like a, a fair criticism of the MLS Next Pro sides to be like they should have done better. Like, why are they losing to these teams? Like, it's a bad look for MLS. Like there was, I don't think there was, if you were having higher expectations than that, then you had too high of expectations. Well, and you know, I, I wasn't actually going to bring this in, but since you went numbers, I've got numbers. I went back <laughs> and I looked at the last four U S open cup first and second rounds MLS. And again, the, it was a manual thing because it was all on Wikipedia. So it was a little tough to, to do it. I was kind of counting as I was going. MLS Next Pro has been upset five times in this thing, right? They're the third division, which means they're only playing teams below them, which means when they lose, they're getting upset, right? Let's back up two years where US uh, USL Championship was playing in 2022. The 25 teams that they had, eight of them were upset. Three of them by MLS Next Pro or NISA, which is were in their first and second year of existence. And some of them had been like their first, the clubs were their first year of existence because NISA was still kind of fluctuating in that, in that realm. Right. Um, the rest were USL one size, which again, pro whatever. I'm not going to take a shot at that, but if you look at the upset rate between uh, a percentage of the 2022 upset and the uh, 2024 upsets, 32% of USL championship sides were upset in the first or second round. 28% of MLS Next Pro. Do you remember hearing a peep in 2022 about these sides getting getting upset and, and USL Championship being a, a dead league that should nobody should play soccer for USLC anymore? And, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. I don't. The idea that just because it has MLS in their name that you got you to gotta dunk on it. And again, should they even be here at all? Probably not, right? And we've had that conversation. We're not defending their, their presence in here. And you, you're allowed to be happy that they're not winning, right? Which is fine. Like, I'm not saying don't be a, you know, if you are an anti-MLS person and you see an MLS affiliate losing, you'll be happy about it. And that's fine. Like, I'm not saying you're not allowed to be happy about it. But give credit where credit is due. Don't use these losses as a, oh, this is why MLS Next Pro should never exist. Give credit to the teams that are creating these upset, these amateur teams that are beating third division sides, right? Because here's the thing, right? El, Far El, El Farolito, right? The, the team that we were talking about. They beat, I believe it was Portland Timbers 2 in the first one. It was like, oh my God, look at that. You know, the, the, the Port, you know MLS Next Pro, they're terrible. The next round, they go on and beat a USL one side in Central Valley. And it was like, oh my God, they've won again. And then crickets, right? And instead of going back in this clip and being like, hey, I want to leave you one final note. Big shout out to El Farolito, the, the team from a, a, a burrito stand in California making, making waves in the US Open Cup. Two back-to-back -back upsets, making it to the third round and playing against, I don't actually know who they've been drawn against yet. I, I have to look it up. But It's, it's uh, Oakland. Oh, playing against Oakland. Great. Awesome. They're going to get another chance at a, at a, at a USL championship side. They've, they've climbed. They're playing everybody from the – how great is that? This is what the Cup's about. And then going on and saying, hey, this is why we don't want you know MLS to go out of it so we can have more of these. Totally fine. A very fair and accurate gripe. Criticism? Gripe, gripe, gripe or criticism, right? Those are the two words I'm looking for. Of, of the situation that is at hand, right? But to completely disregard those two who, or the four rather, excuse me, who have had all these upsets and have, have won against these uh, other D3 teams just to take a shot at an MLS next pro side so that you can take an extended shot at MLS is is lazy, right? There, there are ways you could have gone about that that would have been better. And again, the, what really, again, this would not have been as big of a deal for me if the entire episode was a U.S. Open Cup episode. But, but for the fact that 
it was a 40 second right at the very end of the episode just to get engagement and viewers that we that, I mean, sucked me in, got me. That is just, it, it's such a bad, it's a, it's just bad report, you know, bad soccer reporting, but whatever. I mean, if it was really about like the upsets, then, I mean, Farolito is not the only team from MPSL that is currently still in the competition. So if right. we're about upsets, then you would cover all of the teams that have made runs right. this far. Like there's there's Lubak Matadors, who also are in MPSL and also are in the third round right now, set to play against New Mexico United. Sure, they haven't come up against USL1 and MLS Next Pro, so of course there's no conversation about them, but they beat a NISA team and they beat a UPSL team. Right. And and I don't know where NPSL, UPSL, I think they're all in this relative same uh, division, right? Um, open qualifiers each year since 2019 in the first two rounds have won six games, six or five or six games, which is exactly what's happened here. The only difference is this time it was against somebody with the MLS in their name and now it's a big deal. Which is disappointing because it it it, it lessens the impact of those achievements. Those achievements are massive for those people. And instead of being talked about like they should be, everybody's focused on how MLS should be, you know, dumped on. And I'm not saying you're not allowed to enjoy MLS teams losing, right? Like if when MLS comes in in the round of 16-ish, somewhere around there, if, if all of their teams lose, go nuts. Have a great time, right? Because you guys have, have been very upset with the way that they've they've gone about it great and again there, there are two sides to this coin right like it's like oh it's like it's adults beating beating teenagers right like we shouldn't get too hyped about that but at the end of the day these are these are kids who are hyped to be the next level and apparently some of the mls and next pro teams even took the approach of what an mls team would do and played the reserves of the mls next pro team like people were getting their first appearances in u.s open cup so People were using that to to drop down. At the end of the day, an, an upset's an upset, right? So as much as and and we've said it a bunch here. Now I'm kind of thinking back on it. As much as we want to say like, oh, they're teenagers and don't don't dunk on them because whatever. It's still an upset. It's a it's an amateur team advancing in a tournament to play these these kids or these uh, these other pro teams. Give them the credit they're due. All right. Yeah, that's 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 me done. I think. <laughs> yeah, I think you wrapped it up pretty well. Yeah, it, again, but and we could do an episode like this every week, right? Like th this sort of commentary is an easy one for us to talk about because, as you mentioned, it's low hanging fruit. But we won't, and we'll just leave it here and and move on from there. We'd love to know your thoughts, your comments. I'm sure a lot of a lot of people will jump in on that. So we hope you enjoy it. Uh, we hope you did enjoy it. Uh, and and like I said, leave your thoughts and, and comments. Go ahead and follow us wherever you get your podcast. So that's YouTube and then any podcast platforms uh, so that you can know when the live episodes get put up. Uh, and then follow us on social media. So Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and TikTok. That's where we post all of our clips and and, and try and engage with you guys. And we, we'd love to do that. So uh, give us some follows on there. Uh, I've been Andrew. That's Connor up above me or to my left. I think you're on my right in these YouTube videos that I do. Um, so he's over on my right now. And uh, we really enjoyed having your ears to our words. And we'll see you next time on the next episode of the Designated Players, an MLS podcast. See you.